I've been having a lot of fun in the Testum community, creating um, casual, fun, small, intimate learning environments for you all. And we've got plenty ahead scheduled for 2021. Um, I am particularly excited about today's speaker. For those of you that don't know Benji, you've been living under a rock. Um, Benji is a developer at Testem. He's an international speaker. He's an open source community lover. He's a Node.js collaborator, core team at Bluebird, Sina and Mobex, and other open source libraries. And we're gonna put his GitHub um, in the link below so you all can continue to check out his amazing work and contributions in the community. Um, Benji, how did I do on that intro? Uh, a bit too fluttering, but cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and again, like I mentioned, um, Benji has a real dark sense of humor. He's also very pragmatic. And he's one of those developers that you really want to work with and learn from because if he doesn't have an answer, he doesn't pretend to. He's always about building community and making sure people are heard and getting the best, res um, getting them responses they deserve. So. I appreciate you being here, Benji. We've got a few people joining in the chat, but we're just gonna go ahead and dive in because we've got a lot of great pre-submitted questions today. So I wanna dive into the first question. In your opinion, um, what do front-end developers think about testing um, for the first part of the question? Um, go ahead, tell me. All right, so front-end developers, like most front-end developers just don't write end-to-end -end tests. Uh, what they typically do is they try like uh, like most of like the like front-end developers I talked to and we did a lot of interviews uh, they either don't have end-to-end -end tests or they uh, have like very few end-to-end -end tests they don't run on the PRs uh, I want to give a caveat that's like the good like a lot of good uh, like it's not a requirement or anything a lot of good front-end developers I know who like uh, I know from uh, like open source and meetups and such do have uh, like end-to-end -end tests and they take it very seriously. Uh, they acknowledge that unit tests are great, but they don't catch all the bugs and uh, they have end-to-end -end tests. Uh, what do they think about testing? It's a hard question, uh, like a lot of people, a lot of different opinions, uh, but I don't think they think about end-to-end -end testing enough, uh, basically. <laughs> That's super helpful. Um, follow up from someone else in the community. How do you evaluate platforms and software when making considerations for new solutions? It, it's it's very hard because it's a, it's like uh, it's full of people trying to sell you stuff. Like when you evaluate a database or you evaluate something, it's like everyone is trying to sell you stuff, and everyone is like giving you all the reasons why you should use them, and like usually none of the reasons why you shouldn't. Uh, like I saw an article about testing that said testing doesn't have loops, testing doesn't have groups, like all the basic stuff that testing obviously does have. Uh, so it, it's very challenging. I tend to ask friends and look at case studies uh, more than like GitHub stars and, uh, and like download numbers. I say that like maintaining uh, stuff on GitHub that has a lot of downloads, but you really shouldn't use and stuff on GitHub that has no stars and you, you might want to use. So basically, like there is no replacement to the human aspect. Uh, if you are not part of the community uh, making the thing, uh, you have to find someone who is part of the community and ask them. I, I know like a few people, I have a friend who built a platform for evaluating packages. I don't think they're ready yet. It's, uh, it's, it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. This is helpful. And I wanna, it's a good follow up. You published um, this amazing study in May, um, Selenium Puppeteer Playwright, How to Choose. And this blog's kind of been trending worldwide ever since. Wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the research process that you put into that and what inspired you to publish this work. So what inspired me to publish this work? Uh, basically, I did a bunch of, so like people probably don't know, but a lot of like, originally this uh, article was a conference talk. I gave it in several conferences like uh, around the world, uh, which was fun. Basically, uh, it, it's like the work of a few years of like reading the puppeteer source code, reading the playwright source code, reading the Selenium source code and working on it in testing. Like in testing, we have uh, like the privilege of checking thousands of different uh, automation projects and seeing like what works and what doesn't work. Uh, like the true story, to be honest, when I joined test team, I said, Hey, there is this new cool Cypress thing. I want to try and use it. And like, I kept trying to use it and I kept running into walls. Uh, uh, and eventually like we added building on top of Selenium, uh, because it was the most, uh, stable and like most portable. 
Uh, so it's basically just taking my experience building the TDK testing dev kit and uh, working on a testing platform and just translating it. Another part is I talked a lot to uh, like engineers working on those projects and like trying to understand why they build things a certain way. And then like the last part is talking to companies using because we built a uh, testing root cause, uh, which uh, touches on Puppeteer and Playwright. It's a free open source tool. Uh, so we talked to pretty much everyone we could find using uh, Puppeteer and Playwright and uh, Cypress. Uh, we didn't do that for Selenium because like everyone is virtually using Selenium. It's like 99% of the market. Uh, so we just picked 10 random people. Uh, they all use Selenium and we uh, talked to them about it. Nice. And what I really liked about that study too was though, is that you created a rating system based off people's needs, right? So people could kind of rate based off of whatever they wanted. And it's all in that document. And we'll share that with you all too. Um, I had another question from Kim in the community wondering, as a front end developer, would you rather use a codeless low code tool or do you want to code your own tests? Uh, so like my instinct is I want to use code but the instinct is wrong. Like it's the same instinct that telling me don't use Google Docs, write your uh, like uh, stuff in Markdown. Uh, don't use VS Code, you write your uh, like JavaScript in Vim. Uh, like do the thing that has the lowest level of abstraction. Uh, like developers tend to like really value simplicity over complexity and learning like a low code or cordless tool is more work. However, like once you get familiar with like low code and cordless tools, they are much faster. Like uh, Oren, like the CEO loves to do this challenge where like he takes anyone who is like a developer and tells them, okay, uh, pick any, any random websites. I write 10 tests, you run 10, write 10 tests, then they run. And let, let's see who finishes first. And he always wins with like the cordless tools because they're just like that much faster. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a nice way to put people in their place when like they, they say, hey, like coding is much faster. Uh, however, there are advantages of coding, uh, like the tooling is, is much easier to integrate. Uh, but when we built like a coded version of testing, we found like that the codeless version was generally just better. Uh, there are of course advantages and reasons to consider the coded version. Uh, but it, it's kind of like using SAS versus like using desktop, so desktop software, uh, I guess. Uh, but like, I think codeless shines in that it's a, it's like a smaller problem domain. You can do less things in a codeless version, which means it's much easier to do things like auto grouping or like the AI features in testing in the codeless version than in the coded version. And just like limiting your problem domain gives you so much power and like keeps the developers in bounds and like doesn't let them uh, build the seven levels of abstraction uh, they otherwise uh, typically build. Nice, nice. So one last question before we flip over to a subject that is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> and I think probably some people will be watching on YouTube later. Um, I want to know a little bit too, last question in this area is, what have you learned from coding that you would be able, that you would apply to designing tests? Like, are there any principles? Like, what have you learned there? Pretty much everything. If you watched my talk about like, uh, um, like how to treat, uh, like I, I actually, I think I mentioned this in the Puppeteer, Playwright and Selenium uh, uh, talk, but basically like tests are code. There is no, or, or in like the, the testing best practices uh, uh, webinar, like tests are code, they are not different. Uh, everything that applies to uh, coding applies to testing. Uh, we have this very weird divide in the industry where there is like automation engineers and test engineers and developers, but it's a very artificial divide. Like test code is test code. Uh, it's just a different type of code. It's a different type of automation. Uh, Front-end programming uh, or back-end programming isn't easier or harder than testing. It's just like the amount of code and the amount of tests you do, you have to uh, write in order to like make the project as hard as like, uh, like a front-end project. Uh, so everything that you do in regular code, like don't repeat yourself, like uh, uh, try to uh, keep best practices, uh, don't write very long functions, uh, give variables meaningful names, uh, think about the architecture of your tests and so on, uh, are like equally important for tests uh, um, as like any other type of code. Mm -hmm. That's super insightful. I appreciate that. Pivoting over a little bit to a topic that's been pretty hot. We've seen a lot of talks about this online, testing in production. <laughs> Your face right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, so, so it, it, testing in production is the thing that like everyone tells you you should do, uh, or like a lot of people tell you you should do, but it, it, it's pretty tricky. The reason is, it, it, is that it, like 
testing in production, like your tests need to be meaningful. They need to test real flows in your app. Uh, your app has state, like the state is in the database. Uh, when you run your tests and your tests run a lot, they create state in the database. And when you can just kill and restart the whole database, like you're doing your end-to-end -end tests in, in like a staging environment, then you can get a corrupted uh, uh, like state. You can do cool things like the, there is like cows engineering and just like killing services in production, uh, which isn't like end to end testing in production, it's just like uh, testing stability in production. I consider that different, but uh, like running end to end testing production. So we run end to end testing production, right? We, we test testing in production to check regression. We have a monitor. Uh, it's very tricky. Like it's not for everyone. And like the amount of tests I would write in production uh, is much smaller than the amount of tests I write against uh, staging. However, and, and there is like one, one, uh, one caveat. If you do microservices, uh, you probably want to test one service in staging, like the one you're muting, like whose database you're muting against a bunch of services uh, in production. So that when you deploy that service, you get like the same version that you would um, in production. So basically testing in production, uh, mostly monitoring, like uh, uh, the simple stuff. Uh, be very careful not to corrupt your database because you can't do the cool thing where you start with a, a blank uh, slate. Uh, like starting with a blank slate means all the customers lose the data. Uh, and chaos engineering is separate and cool and you should do it from a certain scale, maybe. I like that. And we did have a follow-up question. So I think you kind of touched on that there. Um, Severin, if you feel like it, maybe if you want to do a follow-up to that too, but you want to turn your camera off, you can go ahead and speak into your mic. Should I turn my camera off? Well, no, I love your camera on. I'm just saying it's a to you. <laughs> no, I, I think you, you, you described the problems pretty accurately. That's exactly where I'm stuck right now. So we want to get at least a little bit of testing done in production. But on the other hand, if we only do the very high level stuff, we don't really get much value out mm -hmm. of it. Um, and if we actually want to do something that is more like an end-to-end -end test case, like let's say a checkout process or something like that, then you have all the state that you have to manage. And that's where I'm stuck right now. And uh, yeah, but um, I think you, you showed the problem very well, but I don't think uh, I've yet found a solution for this. So if you have uh, maybe an example project or something where they handle this better, you can totally uh, show it if you want to, like not today, but. <laughs> Awesome. Um, follow up to that too. And I want to make sure we leave time. Um, we do fly through this half hour pretty quickly. We have some more pre-submitted questions, but I want to make sure that we leave time for those of you who are here today. Claire, are there any issues and or, you know, questions that you have for Benji that we can help with today? Uh, yes, actually. So I'm like right at the opposite end of the scale. We're doing zero automation right now. And I'm the only tester in the company. So I'm having discussions with my manager at the moment around our quality strategy and what the best thing for us to do is. The biggest problem that we have right now is that we're breaking existing stuff rather than shipping buggy code. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have a growing need for better regression testing, which probably lends itself to automation. Um, where would you recommend that somewhere like this kind of company would start? Because it's quite... I've, I've yet to find a different word for this, but it's quite an immature testing process. And I really hate that word, but I, I can't, I've not thought of a different one yet. Um, yeah, we're like right at the start of that journey, where to start. So, so like, I don't like sounding like a salesperson, but if you don't have all the automation expertise inside the company and you don't have like an infrastructure team to manage your grids and all that, I would really consider testing because it, it would save you so much time in, in like uh, getting the project set up. You just go, you do click, click, click. You get like the login flow very quickly. You record like five, six tests that just like cover the basic flows. And basically uh, the way I would do it, other than like sitting with the product, figuring out all the requirements, which I guess are probably not written. You don't have like a test plan. Uh, and, and just like making test plans for everything. I would just take like the 10 last bugs and write end-to-end -end tests for them using testing. It would take you like half a day tops and then set them to run every day. And ideally eventually like uh, connect them to the CI because there is like a, I'll call it like a developer friendly way to use testing, uh, which is you connect it to the pull request flow, to the GitHub checks, to your CI and, and so forth. And there is like, a, a, like the, my developers don't want to help with this uh, flow of testing 
which is like you create your test yourself, you don't talk to the developers so much, and like you show, you use like the scheduler. You tell it to just like run every day and like spot regressions or you define a monitor, like something that runs a VR and finds regressions in like the staging environment. I would start with that. And then like when you show the value, so in my experience, the reason a lot of companies don't have automation is that a lot of like managers don't understand that they need automation. It's hard to convince them and like, I, I used to work for a company where like a, a long time ago, where like I, I come to the office, like there was manual QA, the QA cycle took like a week, uh, uh, which is a lot. Like the version, like the dev cycle was shorter than the QA cycle. And then like stuff would break. And I was like, hey, maybe let's automate this. And they were like, no, automation doesn't work. We, we, we tried Selenium like 10 years ago when Selenium 1.0 was slow and like, uh, like buggy. And I was like, <laughs> because like the, the dev cycle there could be reduced from like a week of testing to like at like 10 minutes or like 20 minutes of testing because 95% of the website doesn't change and it goes through regression anyway. Uh, I would definitely do automation. It, it, it's, it's so much like the value, like what testers do in, in testing here is that they think about what they need to test. They do the test plans and then like the actual testing is the easy part. They do it in like a few minutes, they record a test and that's it. They never have to think about it again. Um, so uh, definitely automate. If you don't want to use testing, uh, the open source alternatives are good, like Profiteer, Playerit, and Selenium. But they do require a lot more work on your part of like setting the CI flow and like uh, grids and so forth. Uh, but like between uh, like those and not having automation, definitely take those. So that's like it's, it's like not having automation is so expensive. Such a time waster. I, I I have nightmares and like flashbacks from the times I had to wait a week to change for changes. And then like there is the dreaded the developer pushed a fix and the fix broke other stuff and you have to do a regression all over again. And it, it's just like such a frustrating flow that doesn't like uh, bring out the potential of uh, like the people doing the testing. Perfect. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I have to say too, as a, as a community manager, um, Claire, I'm also the worst marketer out there. I really do though believe in having, continuing that what we've been doing in this community is we've been continuing to bring people from all backgrounds um, to kind of shed a light, not just on, you know, test automation strategy and tools and solutions, but also connecting y'all with industry leaders in our space. So you and anyone who's watching on YouTube after when this recording is posted, we'll put the link for the Testum community below. Feel free to sign up. We do not market or spam, although we do understand how that might come across in this recording, but it is authentic. <laughs> <and fun. laughs> we are transparent, you know, we, we, we understand. But I will say the one amazing thing too is that like Benji and all the devs, they are they're absolutely brilliant and they work hard every day to come up with the best solutions for everyone out there to make sure you all are saving time and improving outcomes for your customers. Customers. And the one thing I really love too is that, and this is like the former social worker in me, that we did actually create uh, a community plan that was free, right? So you get a thousand runs for free per month. And so I always push that to people who maybe you don't have the budget go ahead yet, but you're just like, hey, let's try something out. I'm like, just go try it out. Just go try it out. The joy that you'll get when you run your first test. You know what I mean, Yon Majest? Like there's there's something there I think is really beautiful. Um, so I would definitely encourage that. Another thing that we did during this time um, was to help kind of give people not just that that confidence, but also get the more up level their automation skills is we created a free test MEI certification program and you get a certificate at the end. So those are some things to check out, but that's me going boop. Um, I want to say hi to Mona, who just joined in way as well. Um, do either of you have any questions? That's okay if you don't, because we have a ton of pre-submitted ones. <laughs> Severin, what about yes. you? I see your mute off. Go yes. ahead. Yes. <laughs> um, do you have a, an opinion on contract testing with tools like uh, Pact? Uh, I did some contract testing. Uh, I used to be a fan. Uh, there were very nice tools for contact testing in, in like .NET uh, I worked with. And I wrote some Eiffel. Eiffel is like a programming language where it's uh, like a big part. Uh, I am theoretically in favor. I don't like the tooling. I think it makes life uh, kind of hard uh, the way it currently works. I haven't done contact testing in a year. So maybe like in the last year, like everything suddenly became very understandable and easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but my experience is that it, it, it's kind of like 
if the tooling was good, I would be mm -hmm. in favor. Okay, so we, we will have a, a completely separate team that will use our API soon. Mm -hmm. And we are still not exactly sure how to uh, how to work with them, except like making sure that we have versioning and things like that, so that if we change things, we don't break their stuff. But mm -hmm. I thought maybe contract testing could help in that regard. Um, but you, you say it might be a painful process to get there, or no? So, so basically, if you have like they have uh, they have integration tests in like in like your consumers, like everyone using your service have integration tests. When you run your CI before making changes, you run all their integration tests uh, as well. And then if you break your API, like if you break your inter integration tests, you know. That's like the, the, the that's the trick you typically do. Now, I, I'm not mm -hmm. like against contact testing and like testing the, the API is good typically. Uh, I am not in favor of like writing a lot of tests for the edge cases in your API that other people might not be uh, relying on because it might slow you. I think it's more beneficial to run like the integration test of your dependence. And, and by the way, this is what we do in Node.js. When we release a new version of Node.js, mm -hmm. we run uh, a project called uh, Canary in the Goldmine, and we run the unit tests of all the popular models in uh, NPM against like the new version of Node. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. Um, and so again, we did have a ton of pre-submitted questions, Benji, but I do not think we're going to get all the time because I value everyone's time here. I had one last question here. So kind of thinking a little bit about um, 2021, right? I know as marketers are like, 2021, get prepared, you know, all that jazz. But looking at people who um, are looking at different automation solutions, and we had this question from a community member, they um, they have been, you know, trying out a few different solutions and they're trying to make some quick wins for their boss with automation and kind of show, hey, this is how this is working because they're scaling quickly on their team and they've got some new people coming in. What are, if you had to say like 2021, let's go, what are like three quick things that someone can do to prove automation wins to their boss? Uh, like catch a bug before it reaches production and show how you can like prevent bugs in production in the future. So uh, like some companies have great culture. In my opinion, most companies, uh, like in my, and that's not my, my opinion, it's my anecdotal experience. Most companies don't. In most companies, automation is a hard sell because it's an investment for the future. Like automation doesn't fix bugs now. It will like prevent bugs in the future. And it's a big time saver. And a lot of companies like testing isn't, obviously isn't one of them, but a lot of companies, it's a very hard, hard sell. You have a feature, you just like, they don't want bugs. So they tell you like test the feature and they don't give you time to do automation, which takes time, like the expertise takes time and like uh, actually offer you the test takes time. Uh, so either find like uh, like your five uh, last bugs and like automate them. So like when there is a regression, like do, do it quietly, like you don't have to tell anyone. And when there is a regression and automation it catches it, that's like your huge win is, hey, uh, here is how we saved you hundred thousand dollars, and suddenly you're like you're like the all star, and you uh, like everyone uh, everyone is yay. Uh, we saved a lot of money thanks to that. The other thing is if if there is a flow that breaks a lot already, uh, and and you can automate it. Uh, I guess it's kind of the same thing from the other angle, like finding a bug ahead of time, and then like uh, showing how um, like bugs will not repeat. Nice, nice. I really appreciate that. As we wrap up. Um, I want to say we've got plenty of exciting events coming up in 2021. We've got Julia Pottinger, Automation Evangelist, coming. We're going to teach you how to improve your documentation and improve test coverage across an org and break down that tribal knowledge, um, coming up with Meredith Folk. Um, and then we've got a ton of amazing um, leaders coming up in February as well. And also, we have one of our own Testum customers who's going to kind of share a senior front-end developer's take on test automation and team alignment and give you all the tools, regardless of whatever solution you're using, how you can scale and implement quickly across your team and org. So be sure to check out those in this community as well. Um, I want to say as well, Benji, you're you're a treasure. Thank you for letting us have these intimate learning opportunities to network and, and connect with you. Uh, you're just the best. So I want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, y'all. We appreciate you watching. Take care. Thank Bye. you.